y'all. Coach Nephi here. Looking in chapter 14 of the third testament of the Bible. Yep. In this class, we're going to be talking about Christianity. We're going to be talking about churches. And we're going to be talking about worship. Now, you're looking here at the outline of what's included in chapter 14. And I have been praying and asking for the Father's guidance on how to do this class. And the way I understand it is that he wants me to go down through the entire chapter. But unlike the days when we uh, first started doing classes on the third testament of the bible instead of touching on every word in every verse it seems as though he wants me to expound on certain verses as we go down i'm not sure how it's going to work out but we're going to leave it up to the father for his guidance giving him all praise and honor for anything that comes out of this class if you would go ahead and hit the like button now because it's easier to remember to do it now than it is to remember to do it later go ahead and hit the subscribe button if you haven't done so already and if you like this type of scriptural content, hit that bell button down there so you can see when these classes come out. We're always digging through scripture, looking for facts that we need here in these end times. And one more thing before we get into this class, I want to thank the people that are sending in these donations, um, helping keep Hermes Academy up and going, helping keep Hermes Academy online, and allowing us to continue to upload these videos. I'm going to send out an email later today asking the individuals that have donated if they mind me using their names in future videos. Um, we would like to show our appreciation for the people that are trying to help us out. And we'd like to share the names of these individuals, even if it's just the first name, so that people can show their appreciation as well and add them to their prayer list. Because remember that these guys are helping to keep Hermes Academy going. And if you have a channel or if you have a website or anything that you would like to promote, we wouldn't mind giving you a shout out over here in one of our future videos. And that reminds me, you guys who have channels, you know, I would consider doing a collaboration with you guys sometime in the future. If you are in agreement with what we talk about over here in Hermes Academy, we can share notes in a collaboration video. And even if you're in disagreement, we could probably debate in a collaboration video if you want to. It doesn't matter to us. Iron sharpens iron. All right, without further ado, we're going to jump in here to chapter 14. It's on Christianity, churches, and worship. You can see it has 10 sections here. And what we're going to do is we're going to go down through here, hitting the highlights on some of these sections. I'm not sure how far we're going to make it. We're going to leave it up to the Father for guidance. All right, let's jump right into it. All right, now, this is the Third Testament of the Bible, and it's broken down not only in chapters, but it's broken down in sections, as I would call it. And this right here, chapter 14, begins uh, section 3 of the book. Section 3 is called The Era of the Christian Church. Now, <clears throat> we covered this era in our last class, how the current era that we live in as ERA started in 1 AD with the birth of Christ that is the second era that is the era of the Christian church people call it the church age or the age of grace or something like that but we are about to go into the third era the third era is starting here sometime and about now it may have already started I'm not sure I did hear somebody talk about it a little while ago is that that's why the world is going through so many upheavals and uproars right now. So much chaos is going on is because the world is actually changing from the Piscean age to the Aquarian age. And the wars that you see on all of the riots, all of the protests around the world, all of the wars that are taking place, all of these disagreements boils down to the people who are wanting to proceed into the Aquarian age are at war against the people who want to stay in the Piscean age. In other words, those people who like the Piscean age, the current age, the church age, don't really want to transition over into the Aquarian age. But the guys wanting to transition over into the Aquarian age are pretty much going to take it by force. I don't know if I would say that, but I do know it's going to change. There's no way we can stay in the current church age. It's going to have to be a transition into the Aquarian age. There's really nothing we can do about it. 
even though people can try to resist what do they say resistance is futile but anyway let's jump into chapter 14 now in the first section is called the development of Christianity and you see in there verse 1 you can read it there on your screen if you want to I plan on putting the entire chapter down in the comment section of the video or you can look at the description for a link to the third testament of the Bible you can do a search for a third testament dot PDF on Google and it'll point you to the same website at jesuscomes.com there's also an audio book on YouTube that you can get and you can actually listen into the third testament and you could find this chapter chapter 14 if you wanted to listen to the entire chapter 14 but we're going to just hit the highlights here all right now looking here at verse 1 what it's talking about here is the early church period you may not be familiar with the story if you look at the playlists over on our channel we have one playlist down here called church history by Tom Nelson of Denton Bible Church it's about uh, it's about 13 videos in here where this Tom Nelson goes in and gives a very detailed history of the church if you ever want to know how it is that the church is the way it is in nowadays time this will be a great video to look at a great series to look at if you want to educate yourself on the church I don't believe that anybody should be really teaching and preaching on the Word of God unless they have actually gone through and studied this right here it, it'll it actually clear up a lot of confusion make them quit parroting a lot of stuff that they've you know heard that is actually incorrect because they'll learn the sources of where some of that information comes from you know this is this is extremely important for anybody who wants to teach it teach the Word of God is to understand the history of the church now, I've actually gone through and listened to that entire uh, series about twice and you know it's amazing the level of content that you know Tom Nelson put in those videos and the level of detail he gave as far as you know how the church is the way it is where it came from and all that kind of stuff but that's what's talking about here the early parts of the church see right there when he says my apostles continue my work and those who came after my apostles continue their labor because as we remember the 12 disciples of course they were there about um, sometime around 70 AD um, even up to 90 AD I think is when the Apostle John died of old age he was the last Apostle but these guys continued on with the teachings of the Messiah all the way up to 312 AD it was only it was in 312 AD that the current church took over that's when everything changed over that's when we started getting Catholic churches and Protestant churches and all of the church as we recognize today didn't happen to 312 AD and so you say well what happened between 70 AD or what happened between 33 AD and about 312 AD well that's what's being described here in verse 1 but you see down here even the individuals that carried on the Word of God ended up mystifying and adulterating the Word of God in other words they contaminated it and that typically is what happens that's why the Sadducees and the Pharisees rejected the Messiah when he showed up in the first place is because they had already adulterated the word given by Moses and so they wasn't ready to embrace the Messiah when he showed up because they were ready for a king with a crown and a scepter all dressed in purple smashing anybody who you know got in his way or whatever and when the Messiah showed up barefoot and homeless and humble they didn't recognize him and they said no nah, this can't be our king and so they rejected him but I note that it was the the Pharisees and the Sadducees that actually did that you know people like to say it was the Jews that rejected the Messiah no 
the general population welcomed the Messiah. They followed the Messiah. They listened to his words. They obeyed the Messiah even after he was gone. You know, it's you're in error when you say that the Jews rejected the Messiah. It was really only the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the leaders of the of the uh, I'm gonna say church for a lack of a better word. It was the leaders of the church that rejected the Messiah. The regular old common man like you and me, we loved him. You know, he was healing the sick. He was, you know, helping us out a lot. But those church leaders, they recognized that he was threatening their way of life and they really wanted nothing to do with them. Well, this is actually what's going on today. Instead of Pharisees and Sadducees, we have preachers and teachers. But the same thing, they're in exalted positions, they have churches, they have, you know, huge congregations, you know, some of their congregations are giving them great wealth or whatever, and they don't want anything interfering with that. And so when they see this third testament of the Bible coming, or when they see an individual coming and speaking the truths of the third testament, or even the truths of the Old Testament and the New Testament, um, they want to try to shut those individuals down and um, marginalize them only to protect their own wealth, only to protect what they have. That's what they did in the Messiah's time, and that's what's going on now. That's why you don't see the Third Testament being promoted as much as you think it should be. Because the Third Testament, it, it, it shines light on the errors of the that we're making in the church and these guys don't want their livelihood threatening so they don't really want you to know about the third testament they may be reading it themselves but they ain't gonna come out and tell us about it but anyway let's go on now look at right here in verses five and six it's talking about the woman of samaria the Samaritans were the members of the other ten tribes. You hear them called Jews that was there with the Messiah. They called them Jews because they were of the tribe of Judah or Judah if you try to pronounce it correctly. Which consisted of only two of the two tribes of Israel. The other ten tribes, they went to the mountains of Samaria. And they became even more off track. And that's why the Samaritan lady was like, hey, y'all don't y'all Jews don't really talk to us. It's because they were their brothers, but they were even more off track. But you remember, he told her that, you know, he had to live in water. And if he if she were to drink of that water, she wouldn't thirst anymore. Well, you see right here in verse five, it says, if humanity had drank of that water, it would not be in such misery. Talking about all of the famines and wars and all of the hardships that is that are affecting humanity right now. Verse six says humanity did not preserve in my teachings, but preferred to take my name to create religions according to their interpretations and convenience. They took on the name. This is what that commandment says when it says don't take the name in vain. It has nothing to do with the word mad dog spelled backwards. Taking the Lord's name in vain means calling yourself of the name of the Messiah without actually doing what it says. The Messiah told us that he didn't come to get rid of the law. He came to fulfill the law. But there's a lot of individuals out here who claim his name. But want nothing to do with what he actually taught us. Remember he was barefoot and homeless. But yet we want to be exalted and wealthy. Which is completely opposite of what the Messiah actually taught us. But yet we call ourselves Christians. That's taking the Lord's name in vain. That's taking the Lord's name in vanity, no different than people put on a big Jesus piece and walk around or a big cross and walk around sinning all day. That's the same thing. That's taking the Lord's name in vain. But he said that but he says that humanity as a whole has done just that. Instead of obeying the Messiah's teachings, 
we prefer to take his name and create religions according to our own interpretations and conveniences. I was at a church not too long ago and they they were being a little harsh on some young kids that they had came in contact with who were acting like young kids. I'm talking about 21, 23, 24 year old individuals that they had saw drinking and smoking and joking like, you know, little kids do. Even grown ups do it too, but these happen to be little kids. And they're sitting there talking about, you know, them drinking and smoking, and I'm sitting there listening to it for a while till I couldn't take it no more, and I actually spoke out. This was at Sunday school. Which I really only go to Sunday school because I do have the opportunity to talk back. I don't go to church because, you know, there's no opportunity for me to talk. I don't go to church to learn. I go to church to teach. And so there at Sunday school, I'm sitting there in the pews. And I remind these people that there is no commandment in the Bible that tells us not to drink. There's no commandment in the Bible that tells us not to smoke. And not only that, we're in here, and I use the word we because I don't, you know, I don't want to single nobody out. I said we're in here bashing these people or judging these people for drinking and smoking, which there is no law in the Bible that prevents them from doing so, but yet. We're not keeping the actual laws that are written in the Bible. We're not doing what Moses told us to do. We're talking to them as if they're sinners because they have wine on their breath all the whole time while we got bacon on our breath. And I understand that dietary laws are not part of the covenant, but I just use that as an example saying that. The rules out of the 613 different rules that are written in the Old Testament of the Bible. We're not following most of those. But yet we have these made up rules that you're not supposed to drink. And now we're judging other individuals based on made up rules is my point. We're judging them based on made up rules. All the time while we're ignoring the rules that are written down. There is actually a rule that tells us that we're not supposed to eat pork. Well, let's go on. I look down here at the rest of verse 6. It's talking about how the Messiah did away with traditions. This was another reason why the Pharisees and the Sadducees rejected him. Again, I tell you, it was only the Pharisees and the Sadducees that rejected the Christ. It was not the Jews. It was the leaders of the Jewish synagogue that rejected him. And one of the reasons why they rejected him was because he rejected or abolished the traditions. Stuff that wasn't written by Moses, but had actually become became traditions there in the synagogues one of which was washing your hands before you eat there's not a commandment in the bible that tells you to wash your hands before you eat i mean it may be a good idea but it's not a commandment and so the pharisees and the sadducees who had now taken on this good idea as a tradition saw that the messiah and his disciples not washing their hands and has something to say. That's like the individuals drinking. It may not be. It may it may be a good idea not to drink. But there's no rule telling you not to drink. That's a tradition. That's a tradition of the church. And because of that tradition of the church. The church leaders of today. Are rejecting the Messiah and his true disciples. There's even a feast day around drinking wine. Passover is all about drinking wine. But yet, if you go to some of these church leaders and tell them, you know, that they're supposed to be drinking wine, they'll chase you out of the church. I think it's because most of them are ex-recovering alcoholics or whatever. But anyway, let's go on. Read this part right here where it says, if there is no spirituality in your works, there can be no truth. And what does not have truth cannot come from the father. This is an important verse here talking about spirituality. 
See, this is where humanity is heading right now. This is what this rapture is all about. Spirituality. We are materialistic individuals now. We only understand things we can touch, feel, smell, hear. Things with our, with the, our five or six senses, depending on how you count. Spirituality can't be picked up by any of those five senses. And so we don't really understand it. But we're going to be changed. All of humanity is going to change. That's what the change is talking about. That's what it means why we're going to be changed in a moment. And you go back over here and you read the part of this verse that says, If there is no spirituality in your works, there can be no truth. And what does not have truth cannot come to the Father. Spirituality is extremely important. As man makes the transition into the Aquarian age, the age of Aquarius. All of humanity, this is about to happen to everybody. Now notice right here in verse 7. And you guys jump down there and look at this, you know, because like I said, I'm not covering all of these verses like I used to. But you read right here in verse 7, it says, But the hour comes when the Father shall be worshipped in spirit and truth, for God is a spirit. I really can't believe how there's still individuals who think that the Messiah is going to return in the flesh. Like he's going to be an actual person walking around that they can actually see. That's an odd thought. That our father is going to come back with limitations. The Messiah was limited when he was here. He wasn't omnipresent. He wasn't all places at one time. He was right there in Jerusalem. Walking around where everybody could see him. There was no demonstration that he was all powerful. I mean, he did a few things, but even the things that he did was examples of the things that we too can do. We can control the weather. We can heal the sick. We could do just about everything that the Messiah did, except maybe raise the dead. Unless you're talking about spiritually dead, and then we can do that. All we have to do is remind the people of the Father's truth, and we can raise the spiritually dead. But my point is, is that there was no demonstration of all powerfulness. He didn't move a mountain for him to watch. He did kill a tree, but I can kill a tree. I may need you to turn your head if I want you to think that it's magic or something. You look away and I pour some type of liquid on it and it's going to shrivel up or whatever. But my point is, is that. You know, the father, the Messiah was limited. And so if he's coming back in the flesh, he's also going to be limited. He's not coming back in the flesh. He's coming back in the spirit. He has already came back in the spirit. That's why people are talking about they got the Holy Ghost this and the Holy Ghost that. That is our father with us. This has really only been going on since about the 1800s, about 1884, when the Third Testament of the Bible was being inspired. Has humanity started talking about this spiritualized stuff? That's what it means up there when it says, we shall neither worship in the mountain nor in Jerusalem. There's all these people talking about they're going back to Jerusalem. There's no need to go to Jerusalem. You got individuals that's broadcasting from Jerusalem. Why? The Father is with us in, in, in here in America. To have to go back to Jerusalem in order to commune with the Father, ain't that like when they say that he's in the wilderness or he's in the desert? He ain't no more in Jerusalem than he is over here in West Virginia or Alabama. Or wherever we're at. He's here wherever we're at. We just have to recognize him as a spirit. But again, when we go through this change that humanity is going through, that's what it is that we're going to actually go through. <clears throat> See, I'm hoping you guys understand that this change that we're, that's being talked about all throughout the scripture 
it's described in a bunch of different ways the rapture the third temple New Jerusalem the great awakening the hour of the conscious you can read over here in Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 33 it's the new covenant this change that humanity is going to go through is when the father is going to put his laws on the inward parts of everybody on the planet that is what I believe is going to actually start the tribulation that I believe now I'm speculating a little bit here but I believe this is how the tribulation and why the tribulation is going to start as those individuals want to reject this new thing that is happening to humanity in order to protect their lifestyles or whatever is going to try to make people deny the fact that this has actually occurred. You're going to get stuff like the mark of the bees, wars, a lot of that stuff that's talked about over there in the apocalypse of Elijah. But notice right here how he says in verse 34, and they shall teach no more every man his neighbor. I mentioned in one class not too long ago how I am a Levitical priest. My priesthood ends this year. I turned 50 in January of 2021. My, my priesthood is over. 25 years. I've been in this for 24 years. Well, almost 25 years. I'm within months now. It ends right there in January. I've been doing this for a long time. But there's coming a day when I ain't going to have to do this no more. I ain't going to have to tell you about the covenant or about the laws, or about the rules or what it means to take the Lord's name in vain. That's going away in the new covenant. For they shall all know me. All. So you're at the end of verse. He says, every man his brother. Every man, not a few. Not the, not the righteous, not the Christians, not the worthy. He says every man, every man, every man. That's what, that's what he's talking about over here in 1 Corinthians chapter 52. When it says in a flash, in a twinkling of an eye. We will be changed. That is what the change is. The new covenant. The last verse in this section says. This is my new doctrine for all times. Observe that having the truth in front of your eyes. You have not wished to see it. How can you live it. If you do not know it. It's important for us over here at Hermes Academy. To tell you the truth. It's the most important thing about our channel. Not views, not likes, not comments, not subscribers, not donations, nothing. We're building up our treasure in heaven. And I believe we will get rewarded for it, even if it's just only a few of you guys who get this. Who understand what we're trying to teach you here. I hope you guys appreciate it. Because I don't believe we will be able to change course even if you don't. If you got something out of this video, go ahead and hit the like button. If you didn't, hit the dislike button. But please leave us a comment either way. And may our Heavenly Father bless you and keep you. May our Father make His face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May our Heavenly Father lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace.